Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, um, your host for today. And, and as you know, last week I said the fact that Lisa was going to come back here. I mean, we were right in the midst of what do we do here, as for, especially you seniors out there, trying to get a sense of uh, how do we fit in all of this. And then especially a lot of other folks, young folks, who in most cases doing our, doing our particular time, uh, wasn't even required to have any kind of insurance, you know, hey, you were just home free and going to school and having fun and whatever, and so now all of a sudden there's, there's this expectation, and a lot of them don't know what that means, but anyway, but uh, we're going to have some discussions, Lisa and I, in fact, since the last show that was past Sunday, we have been here about seven days now discussing these issues, trying to figure out what is going on, and I tell you, I'm still confused, Lisa. Right. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank okay. you. Thank okay, you for good. having me back. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go back to the AC Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. We got, we, there are some questions that we had left out. We're going to go on and fill those in, and, and hopefully Lisa will be able to answer those for us. And then for those seniors at the end of the deal, we're just going to kind of go through the Medicare, Medicaid kind of deal. Okay. And this way we can kind of review your plan, because I'm sure you're getting as many letters as I'm getting, because I'm in that same group now, too, myself. And here we are right here. I mean, we're getting all kinds of letters. Okay. Isn't that fun? I still don't know what's going on, but they're still <laughs> asking me for money. You know, regardless of what, what they're talking about, free this and free this. No such, there's no such thing as free lunch. You know that, folks. I mean, that's a fact, okay? Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And we've got to give you a little plug for your business aspect. That's Health Resources Northwest, right? Health Source Northwest. Health Source. Yes. And you're the principal. One that, you are the principal. I am the principal agent and the owner, and uh, we do, we're do. we an independent brokerage. Okay. So we help people with primarily individual health insurance, right. small group, and Medicare products because it's pretty confusing. And you're a busy person right now. I'm a now. very busy person I know you're a busy person. Right person. See, we're trying to just do it all in one. So please, <laughs> don't, don't, let, don't let our phone get jammed up. I mean, we already have a problem with this huge computer system trying to access all the Everybody trying to access. We take care of everybody. You take care of everybody? Absolutely. Well, see, Lisa's if it's got, not me, it's one of my associates. See, she's got her system. <laughs> so you can call her and you will be, she will call you back. Okay. Absolutely. Is that fair? Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay, good. What was that number, by the way? Let's just throw that out there. What, 503. What okay. 650-2199. Okay, we want to make sure we give her a little little, little hit on that end of Okay, Thanks. we were going through some questions, and we, we've gone through what is the history of the Affordable Care Act. I think we covered that enough. Yeah. Okay, fine. And what do terms grandfathered and non-grandfathered mean, and why is, it, is this distinction important to consumers? I think we went through that, too. We pretty, did. Pretty extensive. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, let's say this third one, let's see, what major changes to insurance coverage are scheduled for 2014, and what are the positive and negative effects to the consumer. We, we, we did some of that. We did some. I wanted to kind of circle back and touch okay, a little bit about do that. that. Going on. So when we talk about the Affordable Care Act, um, first of all, back in 2010, mm -hmm. when that law passed, there were some immediate changes to some of the plans, which is why we have grandfathered, non-grandfathered. But as we head into 2014, uh, all of those non-grandfathered plans are going to need to go through some significant changes. There'll be additional mandates that are going to be you know, required, uh, things that we've not seen before in the individual market, such as mental health, prescription, those are going to be mandated coverages, and more importantly, an odd one called pediatric dental and pediatric vision. This will impact everybody's plan, whether you have children in your plan or not, your plan will need to include coverage for pediatric dental services and vision. The other major shift is how much out of pocket. So whenever I'm working with a consumer, the big thing is, okay, here's our premium, that's what we're going to pay monthly, but in the event, in the catastrophic event, I want my clients to understand what is that going to cost them. Mm -hmm. So that's talking about what are the out-of-pocket costs for seeing the doctor, for your prescriptions, but more importantly, what's that annual deductible? Mm -hmm. And what's that piece beyond it that people get a little uh, fuzzy with? It's called coinsurance or that percentage that you're going to pay beyond your deductible. What is that and where does it cap out? Well, we've got plans right now that might have an out-of-pocket cap of 15000 mm -hmm. And as we head into 2014, all of our insurance plans will need to have a, a maximum out-of-pocket of, of 6350 That is not just deductible and coinsurance. That's inclusive of your doctor office copays and your prescription copays. So that's really changing the marketplace. So I've heard some people, and I've even had some of my own clients, getting some pretty significant price increases because they might be on a plan right now that's a really high deductible or really high max out-of-pocket. Maybe it's 10 12 10 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, but now they're coming down to an out of pocket of 6,350. That's going to shift their current premium drastically. I've had some clients with a double or sometimes even a triple price increase as the carrier has to map them from what they had into a new compliant plan. We're also seeing the terminologies are different. So the Affordable Care Act set up 
metallic tiers. So all of our health plans will follow along a metallic tier design. That could either be a platinum, gold, silver, or bronze. You do do that before, but one, go, let's go through that. Yeah, let's, and and so, by the way, before we get into that point, again, for the benefit of the seniors and, and like myself and whatever, mm -hmm. As you're going through these explanations, and this is health insurance pre-65. Yeah, yeah. Make make sure you make the point yeah. that it's going to impact seniors. Or we're not talking about not we're not talking about impacting seniors, right? Not yet. Okay, we'll we'll talk about Medicare right, a little bit right. later. But, but right. make sure you mention the fact. Hey, if, when seniors come in, make sure you say, "Hey, here, listen closely." Absolutely. Okay? Right, good. So on. we've got metallic tiers in our market here in Oregon. You're probably not going to see a lot with platinum. Those are too rich in design. The carriers didn't feel they're going to be um, marketable. So you're going to see mostly gold, silver, and bronze. So depending on which level you go with, for example, a gold is an 80% actuary value. The idea being that as the consumer pays for their services, they're paying about 20% of the cost. The carrier's paying the other 80% up to that maximum amount of pocket. So as you go down to silver, that's a 70% actuary, and then bronze is a 60% actuary. And when you look at any brochure for any carrier, if they're selling a standard gold, a standard silver or a standard bronze plan, those plan designs, the, the co-pays, the deductibles, and the co-insurance and the max out of pocket will look exactly the same from one carrier to the next. Mm -hmm. Of course, what will differ is the carrier, their strength, their mm -hmm. network, their price. But the state of Oregon did allow each of those carriers to come up with what we call innovative plans. So within each metallic tier, you might see carriers come up with one to three or four different versions of that metallic tier. Okay. So so there are quite a few plans in the market to look at. We've got plans that are sold both inside our exchange, which is called Cover Oregon. The same plans are also sold outside the exchange. You've got a few plans that are only sold inside the exchange, and then you've got many more that are sold outside of the exchange that aren't accessible inside. Mm -hmm. So th there's this very broad market, but there are two different markets. And you want to be clear, am I going to be going direct to the carrier or do I think I might qualify for a tax credit and I want to go through the exchange? Because mm -hmm. the only way to achieve that tax credit to assist you in paying your premiums is if you go through and enroll through the exchange. Same thing for the small business owner if they want to get that tax credit incentive. That has to be done through the exchange. But if you look at the, um, the poverty level charts and whether or not you'll be eligible, if you're not going to be eligible for a tax credit, quite honestly, you, it's going to take you a lot less time and you're going to have more choice if we go outside to the direct market. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Okay, what about, uh, what, is, what is the individual mandate and what is the financial impact to the consumer, to the person that's going to be using it? So this one I like to really slow down and go over with people because people, everybody's hearing the $95. It's mm -hmm. really more than that. The reality is, as an individual, you're going to be required to have insurance, a qualified plan. So it has to meet the ACA requirements. And with that, if, if you do not choose to have that insurance, you will face a tax penalty at the end of 2014 when you file your taxes. For an individual, that is either $95 or 1% of their gross, whichever is greatest. So if you're a married couple, both of you are subject to either $95 or 1% of your gross. So this could start to add up. As a family, you're, you're going to be looking uh, at a maximum of 2.5%. So it, people need to understand that there is this penalty, and it could be pretty significant based upon your income. As we head into 2015, the penalty is actually either going to be $325 per person or up to 2% of your gross. And then as we go into 2016, right now, it's scheduled to either be $695 per person or 2.5% of your gross. So it'll start off smaller, but it's going to ratchet up. The only people that are not going to be uh, penalized are um, uh, Native American Indians, uh, certain religious groups, if you're incarcerated, or if you would have normally qualified for a subsidy, but for some reason there's some situations going on that you're not eligible for the subsidy, then you wouldn't be penalized with that mandate. But everybody else, they're going to need to get that insurance or face that tax penalty. Okay, what is it? What is the state, well, it was the Oregon state-based exchange uh, exchange versus federal exchange, and what is the main benefit? We have two, right? Right. <clears throat> so we've seen a lot going on with the media. There are only the states that decided to move forward creating and setting up their own state-based exchange, and they did that with federal grants that will fund them for the first year. So beyond that first year, those state-based exchange, ours in New Oregon is called Cover Oregon, is going to have to support itself. So they got money to get themselves going. So that lump going. sum that they're, they're talking that's just about for that right first now, that's year. just for the first year. Absolutely. That's not an ongoing thing. Right. Are, are reapplying for that money. No. So the states have to be able to support themselves with their exchange moving forward. 
Now, there's only about 17 states, I believe, that decided to go with a state-based exchange. Oregon, of course, it was one of the front runners, both in time and how much money we received. And then, you know, our, our neighbors, Washington did one, California's done one. But for those states that didn't set up a state-based exchange, they're relying on the federal exchange. So healthcare.com org or dot gov. Um, that is the one that's had some pretty significant problems um, where people weren't able to log on, they weren't able to enroll. And uh, as the president uh, made mention, they're, they're doing a tech surge right now. So they're actually bringing in, I think I heard as many as two or three other companies to come in and see what's going on with the software. Why isn't it working? Um, the latest I heard is that they're hoping to have it up and running sometime in November, uh, officially. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but that's gonna that's gonna create a very short timeline for somebody who wants to get insurance coverage by January one, because for the exchange to work, basically you're going through the exchange first of all to see if you qualify for a tax credit. So yeah. there's a financial application on the upside. Once you get through that and they determine whether you've, you're going to qualify for uh, a tax credit, then you have to decide what plan. So only the plans that are choosing to sell in the federal exchange are going to be there for you to choose from. Well, the exchange has got to get that information and they've got to transmit it over to the insurance carrier so that they can actually upload your information and enroll you. And then you've got to pay for your coverage so it can go active January 1. So, for example, here in Oregon... If you want January 1 effective date, you've got to be enrolled through the exchange by December 15th. So if our federal exchange serving those 35 states isn't up and running until sometime in November, late November, that's going to create kind of this bottleneck of people trying to get on, get enrolled, and then get that coverage January 1. They will have additional time to get into a system. Um, so we will extend that into January, February, and even into March. So people can still be enrolling during those months. The cutoff will officially be, and, and the president just uh, clarified this, the cutoff is going to be March 31st. You will need to be enrolled in a plan that's going to be effective April 1, and if not, you will be facing a tax penalty at the end of the year. But if there's a possibility that it, the possibility that it doesn't, come out, if you will. It's not working, if you will. I'm sure that you think that will be expanded even more than... You know, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, here in Oregon, because our system's not completely working like they had hoped, uh, they are taking uh, paper applications, so people can go online and do a fillable PDF and submit it that way, or they can fax it in or mail it in, and they're trying to process those manually. Um, so ultimately, I, I don't know if the feds have a system like that. I do know that, you know, again, watching the president speak last week, they've got an 800 number. They're talking about community organizers that are trained. Um, the, the concern I have there is there is no talk about the agent. So obviously, mm, like I, yourself. yeah, like so, yourself. you know, of course, I'm a little biased because I am an agent. But the difference is really distinct. If you're going directly to the federal exchange or the state based exchange and you're using a navigator or an application assister or a community organizer. So there's lots of different names. We don't know what type of background check those people have had. We don't understand what kind of training because they're not insurance agents. So to be an insurance agent, each state that you know, that you might live in mm -hmm. has a set of criteria, training, testing, background check. So I had to go through a background check, which included my fingerprints. Every two years, I have to reapply for my license. I have to prove that I've gone through additional education and uh, make sure that I don't have a criminal record. So they're double checking. So you're classes. a licensed person. Isn't Absolutely. Just... And I have to carry liability right, right, insurance right, 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 in case right. I do give out the wrong advice and, mm -hmm. and I can financially harm somebody. So, so there is a huge distinction between working with somebody who is a licensed agent you know, I am still, you know, what would be considered somewhat new in the business. I've been doing this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I have friends that in the business that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so how do you compare that background, that knowledge base, the understanding of the products and the terminology versus somebody who may have just gotten trained two months ago? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so so how does one check on a person in regards to whether or not they're certified or not? And they've got the, if you will, this. They can ask. I mean, again, when you're calling in, the, the, our, our exchange here, Cover Oregon, is working with agents very actively. So when you go online, you can search for an agent by name. It's all alphabetical. Mm -hmm. You can call up and ask for, for them to give you a name of somebody. Um, not all agents decided to go through the training for Cover Oregon but quite a few of them did. So I think there's roughly about 2,000, 2,500 agents just here in Oregon alone that had gone through the additional training to be able to assist people through Cover Oregon. So not only just help them understand the application process, but even more importantly, understand once we got through that, when now you have the choices of which insurance plan to buy, helping them understand that and being able to advise. Because when you're working with 
a navigator or an application assistor or community organizer, they are not allowed by law to advise you on insurance products. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Cover Oregon told us if they find that out that that's happening, they will terminate those customer service reps or those navigators from the program because they do not have the license to advise on products. So that's the difference. And, you know, a lot of times people think, well, I'm, I'm going to have to pay something. You know, mm -hmm. even people that call me think, yeah. how much is it going to cost for me to work with you? When you're working with an independent agent like myself, there is no cost to the consumer. Our pay is through a commission that's built into the what premium. Up, yeah. And it doesn't matter if you go through the carrier directly, you go through Cover Oregon, you go through an agent. The premium that you're paying is is already been filed. It's been approved by the state. It cannot be manipulated. So there's no upcharge to your premium because you're working with an agent. There's mm -hmm. no discount that anybody can get you. So it's already built in. So I tell my clients all the time, whether you're going to choose to work with me or work with any other broker, I highly advise it because at least that way you're working with somebody who can really be your advocate. That's the whole role is that we're here to help you with the process on the front end, understanding, uh, looking at the products, getting you enrolled, and then continue to be there as a customer service support. There is no cost. Mm -hmm. Just find do, do the right person. Do they blast a number, like a 1-800 number or something that a person can you know, call? Well, say, again, if line. they go to Cover Oregon, Cover uh, Oregon. The, the, Oregon. There's, a, there's a listing there of agents. Well, so they could, they could search alphabetically. I believe that they can search by zip code. They could call a Cover Oregon and say, who in my area Cover is Oregon. listed as an agent? Mm -hmm. um, that's one way, uh, it, you know, Certainly going through Yelp or Yellow Book. There's all kinds of ways I to find it. I didn't call you, right? <laughs> they can call me. You'll give me, well, you give me there me. you go. <laughs> okay. Well, what income levels will qualify for assistance in 2014, and what does that look like? Great. So we are working off of poverty guidelines. Okay. So what the government intended to do with the ACA is, first of all, for states like Oregon who decided to expand Medicaid. So first of all, we decided to open up a state-based exchange. And then we're going to expand Medicaid. What that looks like is any person who's at or below 138% of the poverty mark will qualify for full Medicaid assistance. Okay, now wait a minute. Now, when you think about Medicaid, people are always think about 65 or older getting it. That's Medicare, about? right. That's Medicare, but... but right, so Medicaid, that. two different programs, okay, and that's a great distinction. You define that for So me. Medicare is for people who, who have... Who have turn 65, paid into the system, have enough credits, and or somebody who is prior to 65, but they've been disabled. Social Security okay. disability for usually 24 months or more, or maybe they have a pretty significant disease like Lou Gehrig's. They okay, get so Medicare. Back, so that's that's Medicare. 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 Okay, now we're Medicaid, about Medicaid. Okay. is for people who are at or below a certain level on the poverty line. In Oregon, that has been expanded to 138% of the poverty mark. So what that means, just to give you an example, yes. an individual making 15856 or below, that person would qualify for Medicaid. A family of four making $32,498 at or below that level will qualify for full Medicaid. That means they don't pay anything monthly to have the insurance, and they don't pay anything when they go in for services, both they for medical and prescription. 34000 bucks. Thirty, Yeah, uh, yeah $32,498. Yeah, so. $34,000. You don't exactly. pay anything. Right. Now... For those people that are between 139% of the poverty mark all the way up to 400% of the poverty mark, mm -hmm. those are the people that may qualify for a tax credit, financial assistance, and actually paying for their insurance plan. Hmm. It will, obviously, it scales up, so the more you make, the less subsidy you're eligible for. Um, but the government intended to help people purchase uh, kind of the middle of the road plan. So when we look, I talked about the platinum, gold, silver, right, bronze. Right. So the government's actually looking at your area. So when you apply and you say, okay, I'm I'm at 300% of the poverty mark. Right. Government's going to say, great, you live in this area of your state. And in that area, the lowest price or second lowest price silver plan is ABC Company. And so if that premium, just as an example, let's say the premium was $600. But the government looks at your income and says, based upon your income level, we only want you to have to pay up to $400. It's a percentage of your income. Mm -hmm. So that $200 differential right there, that's what's going to get picked up by the federal government to buy that silver plan. Now, if somebody wanted to buy a richer plan, they can do that. They can pay more money and buy up. Okay. Or they can actually buy down and go to a bronze, and, and maybe the government covers even more of it because they're going to a lesser price plan. Mm -hmm. But that's what's happening there is we're going to first figure out uh, means testing, looking at your income, 
to see where you fall in the poverty level. And then from there, based upon that, how much tax credit do you get to purchase that lowest price silver plant in your mm -hmm. area? Mm -hmm. So a single person making up to 45000 well, actually almost $46,000 could mm -hmm. potentially fall, qualify for a tax credit. And a family of four making up to $94,000 could potentially qualify uh, for a tax credit. But depending upon the plan, right? Depending, well, and again, again looking to help you buy a silver plan. So right. If you want to so, buy a richer plan, you'll be paying that difference. Now, this is, what's the difference between the richer plan? I mean, the, let's say the silver and the gold or whatever, from the standpoint of, I guess, services, right? Uh, Give us an it's example. really Give out of pockets. Example. So, uh, so a gold pocket, plan is going to have lower copays, $10, $20 copays. It might have a $1,300 deductible uh, and then 20% out of pocket after that to that limiting charge, that $6,350. Uh, out of pocket max. Whereas a silver plan has got higher copays. For example, thirty-five dollars to see the primary care, seventy to see a specialist, but the deductible is twenty-five hundred, and beyond that, you're still paying thirty percent to that out of pocket max. Mm -hmm. Now there is a special program for people that fall from two hundred and fifty percent of the poverty mark down mm -hmm. to one hundred and thirty-nine percent. Not only will they get some pretty substantial assistance on their premium to help them pay that. But because they're in that range, again, 139% of the poverty up to 250% of the poverty mark, their deductibles and coinsurance will actually be less. Mm -hmm. The government's going to shrink those out-of-pocket costs down for them and also pay that. on. You know, So if the carrier would normally charge a $2,500 deductible, maybe that person's only paying a $100 deductible okay. because okay. they're at a lower per, per poverty mark. Okay. You know, that was another question that was asked of me to ask you. Okay. Is that, for instance, a person goes to their primary, mm -hmm. let's say 20 bucks. Okay. You go in and pop up 20 bucks, okay? Then all of a sudden, primary checks them out and say, oh, you need to go to specialist. <laughs> then they go to the specialist and cost them Another 40 bucks. Right. What's that all about? Different doctor, right? So, you know, you've got your primary care. He's got his business or his clinic, and he's going to charge a, a, a cost to see you. Now, obviously, the cost to see that doctor isn't $20. It might be more like 100 or 150 or 200 depending on how much time you spent with you. But you're paying just your copay, your mm -hmm. that flat mm -hmm. piece. But he tells you to go to a specialist. Well, he's got his own billable rate, and his billable rate is probably more like $300, $400 for a visit. So you're going to probably pay a higher copay. But again, you pay a copay, the carrier's paying the rest of that cost. Wow. Wow. That, right. That, that's a little good. And then one other, one other thing to mention on the poverty levels, well, if you've got a family who is in between 139% up to 300% of the poverty mark, their children here in Oregon will be mandatorily put on to the Medicaid system. So they'll still be looking for a tax credit to help the adults on the plan purchase their health plan, but their children, because they're below that 300% of the poverty mark, will be put on to Medicaid. They don't have to pay anything? Yeah, no. Don't have to pay anything. So no copay? Nothing. No specialist copay? No, but understand, with Medicaid, especially here in Oregon, we have a new program called uh, these community care organizations. Right. So we've taken our Medicaid population and, and the doctors and kind of divided them up into, I think it's 15 or 16 different community care organizations. So as you enroll in Medicaid, based upon where you live, mm -hmm. they will route you to uh, the CCO that's appropriate, the community care organization for your area, and then that will kind of, they'll, they'll manage your care. They'll manage who, what doctors you see and the care that you receive within that system. Okay, okay. You know, as, as you're talking about the Medicare and Medicaid and the various plans, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, when, when one gives you, if you're given the, the definition of the three different categories, uh, you know, maybe one, two, and three, the my expectation is that number one is the best doctor. Number two is kind of like the middle doctor, and number three is an average doctor. Mm -mm. Are, no. Are they all the basic? No, when we're talking, when I'm talking about gold, silver, and bronze plans or versions of right. those metallic right. tiers, that's how much you're paying in premium and how much you're paying in out of pocket costs to see the doctor, go to the hospital. Those are what we're talking about. Your doctors are really going to be dictated based upon the plan that you bought, so okay. the carrier. Maybe so the same doctor across the board. Exactly. Right? So if you if you buy, you know, thinking, well, I'm, you absolutely, it makes a lot of sense. These folks are getting a better deal. No, you're just paying. You're going to pay more in monthly premium mm -hmm. to have that higher tiered plan, that mm -hmm. gold plan. Mm -hmm. But when you go in for services, your copays, your deductibles will be smaller. Okay. So you have less out of pocket when you need the services, but you're paying more monthly for that. The flip side, of course, which a lot of my clients do, let's pay the least amount monthly. So they might go to the silver or even the bronze. They're going to pay the least amount monthly. They know when they need for services, they're going to have to pay more. But usually those are the people that are pretty healthy. They rarely go to the doctor, so they really don't want to pay more premium than they need to. Um, your doctors are actually more dictated uh, really by the carrier that you're going with. 
So we've got lots of choices in this marketplace. Oregon's got probably the most competitive marketplace nationwide. So it's really going to dictate the network size of your carrier. So, you know, Moda has, uh, Moda Health it used to be ODS companies. They've got all the hospitals under contract. They've got probably the largest provider list. Um, comparable to them would be Pacific Source. Um, you've got a new co-op called the Oregon Health Co-op. They've got a pretty nice, sizable uh, network of hospitals, and they're growing their doctor list. If you go with Providence, um, great company, but the, their network is the Providence Hospitals yeah, and the Providence Doctors. Kaiser, something. Kaiser is a, a locked thing. system. That's an HMO, meaning that you only can be inside the Kaiser system. You can't go outside unless they give you a pass because it's a closed system. Does it cost you more? Uh, to have Kaiser or to, to go Kaiser. outside? To, the outside. I mean, I'm trying to be, again, it, most of the time on a Kaiser plan or any HMO, health maintenance organization plan, that's a locked system. It's a closed system. So you need to go to the doctors and right, the hospitals okay. that are in that system. Unless they don't have the services available, they will send you outside of the circle. Mm -hmm. So that's an HMO. That's a locked system. Uh, you've got PPOs, preferred provider organizations. That is where most of our carriers are at, where you've got a list of doctors and hospitals that are in network and you want to try to stay in network that's going to help keep your prices down or you can choose to go out of network most of the time you don't need a referral to leave the network however you're out of network so two things will apply first and foremost you will have higher out-of-pocket costs maybe it's a higher copay a higher deductible but in addition you've got usual and customary charges what i mean by that is let's say a doctor normally bills three hundred dollars but he agreed, working with a particular insurance company, to drop his rate to 200 Well, if you go to a doctor who's not part of the network and he's charging 300 and that carrier would normally have only paid 200 for an in-network mm -hmm. doctor, that $100 differential, that's going to be the balance bill. And you're responsible because hmm. you went out of network. So I really encourage my clients, we check their doctors. We check the hospitals that they would most likely want to go to. I really encourage people to understand the network size of the insurance carrier you're buying and whether your people that you would like to see are inside or outside because it will make a financial difference for you when you need services. But what if they forget or they don't know and they get caught in there? We, we try to remind them. You know, I, when I, again, when I'm, when I'm working with somebody, uh, if we have the opportunity as we're going through things, I'll, I'll double check their doctors to make mm -hmm. sure what network are they in. I'll ask them what's the closest hospital if you were going to be routed someplace in an emergency. Um, I, I usually encourage my clients once they settle on buy a plan, look up in that network and see who the closest urgent care facility is. Because the reality is we want to keep as many people from going to ER that's not necessary as possible. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a you know, a, a situation, a panic situation, something's going on, especially with your child, it's going to be a lot easier if you've already pre-looked up and kept by the phone that, you know, the, the closest urgent care that might be open later in the week, mm -hmm. might be open on the weekends. That certainly is preferable for non-life-threatening but still urgent situations than trying to go to the ER. And I think any of us have experienced going to the ER in the middle of the night. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. Now, if my finances change, you know, from the standpoint I get into a lower bracket or mm -hmm. maybe a different plan, can I change? Yes, absolutely. In fact, Cover Oregon uh, is even talking to people on their website and, and, and the customer service reps regarding as you qualify for that tax credit. So you might qualify and maybe during the year your income changes. Maybe it's going to go up or it's going to go down. They're encouraging you to come back and tell them what your new income is. Because if your income went up and you're still getting that tax credit based upon mm -hmm. the lower income, mm -hmm. you're going to owe that money back at the end of the year. Mm -hmm in your taxes. Pen pen is there any penalties at all? Not a penalty, but you'll owe the money back because the government gave you assistance thinking that you were at a lower income. Mm -hmm. During the year your income came up, you're going to probably want to let them know or you're going to owe that money back. Conversely, though, if you're take, you know, cruising along, everything's great, but your income drops. Maybe you're right. laid off or something shifts. You're going to want to let Cover Oregon know because you may qualify at that point for some assistance to help you pay your insurance premiums. So it's going to work a little different than the IRS. And if, you, yeah. if the IRS owes me money, <laughs> they don't call me. Top if I owe them, they just take the money. Right. <laughs> no, Cover Oregon's going to encourage why. you to is, come. Is, is, is there, you know what I'm saying? Are we going to have a better plan? A better plan? Yes. I Not the IRS plan. I'm talking about the Iowa plan. Our plan, our, our health plans, there are improvements. There's there improvements, improvements to the plan. There's going to be improvements to people getting access. Maybe they couldn't qualify before, and now they can. Maybe they couldn't afford it before, and now they can. Uh, it looks like we might need to go to a break, but maybe we should. There's now. there's some improvements. <laughs> we'll, yeah, I know. We'll talk a little bit about that so we can come back and get another answer. There you go. We'll okay, come back good. and I'll answer that. Okay, good. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back, folks. Hopefully, you're getting.
You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. <laughs> hey, welcome back, folks. I guess you, you you know where we are now, so we'll just jump right back to where we started here with Lisa, and we were just going through some questions we were asking her, and she's doing real. She's doing a great job, fantastic job. Appreciate that. By the way, I might add too that uh, again, this is another another situation with uh, with with you choose. I mean, um, as you know, I I've, I've got a relationship with those folks, and uh, I mean, it's just working perfectly. Uh, we've got an issue here at Oregon Voters Digest. We call up the you choose folks. They find the best person to represent that particular issue, and here we have them. And here's Lisa, and so thank we want you, to Rick. Lisa uh, thank uh, thank you choose again, and and really appreciate that Deborah and Hannah. They've been doing a great job, and really makes my job a little easier. You know what I mean? Because I really I need all the help I can get, Lisa. We all do. And being a senior, you know, I'm, I'm I really need it now. <laughs> okay. But anyway, on a side note. But anyway, like I said, hopefully you you you're up with us, and as you know, you tell your friends that um, if they've forgotten anything, they want to see it. Over the last two weeks, we have been doing uh, this show, and uh, you may you know the repeat. And if you have missed those repeats here on the local channel, Portland Cable Medium aspect of it, you can go to the YouTube. You can go to YouTube, and it, there it is. It's sitting up there, and, and you can do it over and over. You can email it. I mean, it, it just do all kinds of good stuff. So there it is. Before you before you call your agent, uh, uh, otherwise, if you call, if you call Lisa, no problem. But if you, if you don't know the agent, you don't understand the process, I would suggest very strongly that you call Lisa and, you know, do it that way. And or if not, that look at the show and kind of get a little bit more background of me. So when you start getting this kind of stuff, you know what you're talking about. Because in all due respect, professional folks put this piece together. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we just we're just not in an age factor that we can really absorb this stuff. It's a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of material aspect of it. And then you want know, the other thing is that making sure you've got that was it the uh, uh, the state based exchange, the Oregon state based exchange. Uh, call them. Because in many cases you, you you're, you're lost and whatever. So okay, so let's get back to the, some of those questions. Okay. I think the last time we were talking about we we're at this other part. We were talking about that. If it was going to help, we're going to have better. Yeah. Yeah. It was help. Well, Talk to you me. know, th there are going to be some winners and losers. Yes. Because the reality is, if you've been uninsurable, mm -hmm. you now will be able to to pass. There's no underwriting okay. at all. Okay. No pre-existing exclusions. Okay. So that's huge for those people that have been struggling to get insurance. In addition, there is financial assistance for those people that need it. Um, I personally. And this is just my opinion. Think that we probably went a little too high as a government, saying that we're going to go up to 400% of the poverty mark. I probably would have said, "Hey, let's do up to 250 or 300% of the poverty yeah, mark," because the price tag is going to yeah. be pretty, you know, yeah. substantial. Oh yeah, big and, and their estimates originally versus what their estimates are now, mm -hmm. heading into 2014, have significantly changed. So there is a concern, as any of us taxpayers should have, mm -hmm. on where that money is going to come from. But Again, there's going to be some winners and losers. Uh, a loser might be somebody who was doing just fine with a, a very comprehensive plan and, and liked it, but it was a really high deductible, high out of pocket, but they were happy with that. They might have the finances to weather that uh, deductible. They're healthy. They wanted to keep their premiums down. Those people are seeing significant price increases, especially if they can't afford or, I mean, can't afford, they don't qualify for a tax credit. So now their premiums are up. And in some cases, I've got people that went from a 5000 out of pocket maximum to a 6350 out of pocket maximum and a higher premium. And they're listening to me and they're saying, Lisa, how is this possible? So I'm, I'm, I've, I've got more out of pocket, my deductible's higher, and I'm paying higher premiums. So I've had to have some pretty difficult conversations. Um, in addition, for the younger group, because of how the ACA decided to modify the rating band, mm -hmm. 
Hmm. They want to make sure that there's a smaller band between what the youngest person's paying versus what the oldest person's paying. You are seeing some higher price increases in those young age brackets, the 20 and 30 year olds. And quite honestly, those are the people that we need to get engaged. If we don't get the young invincibles into the system, the, the idea of having everybody covered, which theoretically will drive down yeah. prices, right, right? right. isn't going to work if we don't get those young invincibles in there. So that's still what we're waiting to see happen. Now, the 26-year-old, those are the folks that live within the home, right, with parents? Up to 26, yeah. So policy, one of the ACA changes is a child living uh, at home. Not even necessarily living at home. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But if they're up to you know up to age twenty six, they can stay and remain on their parents' policy. But okay. at age twenty six, they will be kicked off, and they're going to need to get their own insurance. Now, this deductible you're talking about, you know, let's say for instance, I said, okay, fine, if if I can go up to say ten thousand dollars deductible, doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't exist. What 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 does exist? Uh, what's the, the minimum and what's the high? The minimum deductible know. again is going to be you know on the open market you're seeing 500 750 but if you are qualified for a tax credit and you're in that lower no, no, okay. poverty bracket okay. they're going to drive your deductible even lower maybe even as low as $100 however the highest deductible out there so if somebody wants to save premium and they want to go with the highest out of pocket that is a flat $6350 deductible that's going to be the lowest premium you're going to be able to find um, so that's that's going to be a struggle again for some people that had much higher out of pockets because they were keeping their premium low and they could handle that. Okay, yeah. so that, that's an example. Okay, you know we we we're into this piece about well, gee whiz, should I get this stuff? I'm healthy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, I just don't want to pay this stuff. What happens to that person? That is, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about that because you're going to have plenty of people that think, you know what, ninety five dollars, one percent. I don't, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, not. I'll worry about yeah. it then. Uh, and because it's guaranteed issue with no pre-existing conditions, mm -hmm. I can just go buy it anytime I want. Right. That is right. actually not the case. So your window to buy insurance right now, open on October 1st, it will officially close March 31st. And so if you did not buy your individual health plan during that time period, it will be locked out until the following year. Okay. So okay. that's how the market will work. I know for a fact here in Oregon, I believe nationwide, they, they can't, the insurance carrier can't just have you wait until you get a diagnosis mm -hmm. and then go buy the insurance. So <clears throat> to try to make sure people buy at the appropriate time, there's a window, it's called an open enrollment. So if you don't have a, a life-changing event, such as maybe a, a marriage, a divorce, a birth, maybe you move, those would be qualifying events that you would buy insurance during that lockout period. Other than that, you won't be buy, able to buy it again until next fall, mm -hmm. and that window will be even shorter. What'll be interesting is we've got a six-month window this first time. Next fall, that window will be the same as Medicare. It'll be October 15th hmm. through December 7th. It's about seven weeks that both individual health insurance plans, you'll need to look at it if you have one, decide if you want to stay where you're at or move. If you didn't buy insurance this time, you're going to need to take that seven weeks to buy a plan. That's the exact same time period that we're working with our Medicare clients and helping them decide if I'm on a Medicare plan now, is it going to work for me next year? And if not, what do I need to modify? What do I need to change? So we're going to have seven weeks to assist everybody. When that window closes, again, you're locked out until the following year. Okay. I'm now 20. I'm not 26. Okay. I'm 27 years old. I haven't gotten any insurance at all. I have an accident, a busted leg or something like that. Now, we still have policy in the hospital. If they go to the hospital, they, they take do. care of them, right? Are the parents liable for that situation? No. So no. who's liable? They're liable. Okay. So but they don't have any money. So what happens then? Who picks up the tab? Well, the reality is that happens a lot now with our ER system, and so the, the ER uh, facilities write off hundreds upon thousands of dollars every year in unpaid bills. That right there inflates the cost for all of us. Um, but please be aware that just because a hospital might write off the cost that you, you owed doesn't mean that you get off scot-free. Yeah. More often than not, it's going to affect your credit rating. Because you created a liability. You have money due somebody. Mm -hmm. When you went into an ER, went to the doctor, there is money to be paid. Services rendered. So um, depending on the hospital and the situation, if you're low income, I believe they do have some programs to help people waive that off and not have a negative impact. But for those people that could have afforded to have the insurance and chose not to, they are liable. And that will affect their credit rating. So there's a possibility uh, those folks who were, were delinquent, Mm -hmm. Still thinking that everything is cool, right? And then later on in life, they get a job and don't be brought to it. Maybe do they pass that stuff on to some collection agency or something? They might very keep well. Keep an idea and whatever. And then going back to the point of, um, uh, of the fact that there is a cost there. This cost is passed on, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, from the hospital 
i.e. the raises the rate, basically Absolutely. goes back to the consumer, right? Absolutely. And that's basically how it works. And that's why they basically look at it on an annual basis or whatever, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, insurance carriers. And, and granted, an insurance company wouldn't be in business if they weren't making money. Right, exactly. Right? But the reality of insurance is it's an organization that's choosing to take on all of the risk for all those enrolled, and they're going to assess you a premium. But that premium collection, that's what's paying those claims. Right. Because it really about, you know, probably 15 to 25 percent of the people uh, throughout the year will have significant claims. So that's what they're looking to pay. So if the carrier is charged a higher rate from the hospital, the doctor, the lab facilities, mm -hmm. the durable medical company, mm -hmm. all of those increases in cost for services and goods gets transferred over to the carrier. The carrier then has to raise their premiums mm -hmm. to cover those claims. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an absolute correlation, right. okay. teeter totter. So one goes up, the other, you know, right. that's right. what's going to happen. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. How was the ACA funded? The Affordable Care Act. How was it funded? Is there such? Was that such a? Is it, yeah. So um, it? it was pretty interesting. I, Right after the law was passed, you know, there was lots of, of talk and speculation what's in the law because it was put together so quickly. Um, I did see a video. It was pretty interesting. Um, Pelosi was speaking to a room full of people. And in that video, she, Speaker of the House, right? Speaker, Speaker of the House, House at yep. the time did actually say, because I hadn't even known, you know, where was this money going to come right, from? Come from yeah. uh, and as she explained it to that group, um, half of the Affordable Care Act, or the estimated cost for these subsidies and tax credits, mm -hmm. was going to be funded from reductions to doctor reimbursements that are on Medicare, reductions to Medicare Advantage companies, because Medicare Advantage companies are actually paid by the federal government to manage their Medicare, Medicare beneficiaries that they have, and also a very aggressive approach to fixing the fraud in Medicare nationwide. Right. Which, which is huge. We, yeah, and that program has been yeah. around for over 40 years. It's probably the largest incidence of fraud that we have in our nation, mm -hmm. so absolutely we need to fix that. Mm -hmm. But whether you're going to pay for a new system with the idea that you're going to fix fraud, which is money that you shouldn't have spent in the first place, I'm a little concerned there. The other half, though, came from the idea of the individual mandate, the employer mandate, and more importantly, additional fees and taxes levied on the insurance carriers, okay. durable medical companies. So our insurance carriers have two specific fees. Uh, one's $5 a month starting off, and one's a dollar a month going to $2 a month. Some of those are scheduled to sunset after three to five years, but then there's an additional tax, an insurer tax of 2.3%. And that's being levied on all of our individual and group insurers, along with even our Medicare Advantage plan companies. So as, a, as any business takes on additional cost, mm -hmm. and anybody out there who's worked in business or has their own business knows, as your cost to doing business goes up, you pass that through to the consumer. So I do want to have everybody understand, if an insurance carrier is being told they've got to cover more items, they've got to pay higher taxes, They've got to cover services, again, like pediatric dental that mm -hmm. they've never done before necessarily in a health plan. Those costs might seem great, and we're giving people more access. We're giving preventative care at a zero cost. Mm -hmm. It isn't zero. The carrier has to inflate their premium to help pay for all those claims. So we are all collectively paying for that. And again, if we don't do a good job of getting the young and healthy into that pool, then it's going to be lopsided, and the prices will go up even more significantly. Well, you define, maybe give us an example of fraud. Define, you know, oh, there's tons you know. of examples of fraud. So a consumer could be committing fraud if they go to multiple doctors to get multiple prescriptions and then they turn around and sell those medications. Okay. A pharmacy could be committing fraud if you your doctor wrote out a prescription for brand name and without you knowing it, the pharmacy filled the generic but then billed the insurance carrier the brand name drug or gave you fewer pills. A doctor could be committing fraud by ordering durable medical equipment that he's not even going to use on you or ordering additional tests that are not necessary. There are hundreds of incidents of fraud that happen within Medicare, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you might not answer this question, but there's, there's 11 million illegal immigrants, it has been said, yes. here in this country. Yes. And many of them are using those services. Correct. And naturally, you got to pass on these fees, right? It's Correct. raising up these rates aspect of it. Now, what impact are ACA is going to have on that? Are we going to possibly make look at the... Listen. I don't think that the ACA really addresses that at all. In fact, to qualify for the tax credit, you have to either be a U.S. citizen or a legal uh, resident. So these these subsidies, obviously, are not accessible mm -hmm. to illegal immigrants. So you're going to still have a group of people, potentially, who are coming in and using services but not necessarily paying for them. Right, and right. that drives up everybody's price. So maybe ICE is going to play a big role in this piece, right? 
We, yeah, we don't. Yeah, know. That, that, that would be another. Yeah, when you when you when you actually when you go through the exchange, whether it be state or federal, the idea right. of right. going through the People exchange, are going to be registered, you're, you're, yeah, you're going to give them all your yeah. financial. Yeah. You're you're, yes. you're going to give them information about you, everybody in your family. You're going to give them all your estimated income for the following year, and then they're going to if when the system's working, it's going to ping the IRS to see what your tax return was right. the year before. Right. Are you close in your income estimation? Mm -hmm. They're going to ping uh, Equifax to see if you are who you are. There's mm -hmm. actually some really interesting questions you have to yeah. answer to verify you are who you are then they're going to also look to see uh, cms the center for medicare and medicaid services because they want to know if you're already on medicare or medicaid and then also the immigration department they yeah. are making sure you're you're a u.s citizen or a valid uh, immigrant um so those are things to be aware of as it's you go important. through yeah, absolutely we have to, we have to have yeah, checks we and got, balances we've got to do that. Yeah. um one of the things kind of talking about the exchange again and, and costs you mentioned you know i'll back you up a little bit on the cost of the country one, I think of the bigger flaws that I'm hoping will get fixed. Not only mm -hmm. do I think that we went a little high on giving away tax credits to up to 400% of the poverty mm -hmm. mark, but more importantly, there's no asset testing. Meaning, if you've got a, a couple who has been able to retire and they're living off some, some pretty substantial pensions or 401ks mm -hmm. uh, or assets, and they're just pulling enough income just to to pay their bills, mm -hmm. and they've done a really good job of managing their finances, so their income is relatively low. Right. They will still qualify for a tax credit because the government does nothing in its, in its application to say what are your assets. They just want you to estimate what your taxable income is for wow. next year. How did they forget that? I, I'm not quite sure because, you know, and I can't begrudge anybody for getting that tax credit. If that's the rules of the game, right? That's the rules. When you're playing Monopoly yeah. and you're running around the board and all of a sudden one person gets the, the pot on the inside, you're not going to begrudge. That's the uh, rules of the game. Uh, I just think it's unfortunate because I think the intent of the law obviously was to assist those people who can't afford it or are struggling right, to afford right, insurance, right, right. not necessarily assist those people that have assets. So you know, I, I'm really hoping, quite honestly, that that's something that gets addressed in the next year or two because without that... I think that there's a lot more tax credits going out than they had anticipated. To be well, honest, that, that with you. is a major responsibility of the government. That, as we so, as right. I mean, that's why these folks are up there, right? Right. But this think about it. Pros. Think about somebody I mean, who's ridiculous. got an asset base of a million dollars or more, wow. and they're only pulling off income streams to live off that's of, right. but they still qualify for a tax credit. She was. Wow. I don't think that we intended wow. to do that. I know that even exists. I saw a program about the vets, the VA, mm -hmm. and how some folks were basically benefiting, if you will, on on uh, disability. Mm -hmm. And weren't weren't disabled, disabled. Right. But anyway, we we got some problems there in the whole issue yeah. of the government aspect. We need to have better checks and balances. Yes, for yes, sure. Very much so. Okay, okay, we did that one. What are the current estimates in terms of cost to the U.S. economy? We've touched a little bit of that piece, but what do you think? Any idea? I read an thoughts? article, and I wish I could remember the source, but the article that I read several months ago said that look, when they first passed the law back in 2010, the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO estimated that these tax credits that we were going to give out in 2014 were going to be somewhere around $15 billion. The $15 last estimate billion. that this article was quoting was that as of now, as we head into 2014, they're looking at closer 30 to $32 billion. So it's more than doubled. And again, I, I think that the government didn't anticipate who would qualify, who wouldn't. As I was just talking about people, there's no asset testing. You've got more people qualifying than you probably intended. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty significant. I also am concerned about the toll on the economy as itself. I mean, when you've got an employer mandate that says to every employer who's got 50 or more employees, you must now offer health insurance if they're working 30 hours or more. Mm -hmm. We've seen several examples of employers reducing their work yeah. week to below 30. Uh, we're going to see increased costs in goods and services to be able to pay for those. Um, there's there's the, the employer mandate in itself. There's taxes. I mean, this is going to be huge, and and how it will play out. Again, there's going to be winners and losers, but we we need to think about that. There's always unintended consequences. Um, you know, I'm not a politician, mm. um, but I would hope that we could get to a point in the future where, as we're looking at passing laws, that we maybe bring it down and get more finite. We don't create laws where we throw everything in the kitchen sink in at the last mm -hmm. minute and then figure it out later. <laughs> But, you know, that's probably the old accountant in me speaking because I, I did spend quite a few years doing accounting work. So, Well, that might be something that I'll get you choose to check in on. There we go. Get, get me, bring me a politician that knows what they're talking about exactly. and what's going on. A straight one. Absolutely. Okay, okay what were we trying to fix and will we get there? We, we, I think we talked a little bit about that, but I thought... We did. Well, let's recap that a little bit. You, this way you can just kind of recap a little bit yeah. more of everything. The law is pretty clear. They wanted to 
grant everybody access to affordable health care. Now, health care, health insurance are two different animals. Right. So we all have access to health care. It's whether or not you can afford to pay for the bill. So obviously most people go out and get insurance. That's how you're going to afford those potentially catastrophic events happening. Um, right now, the numbers, depending on what year you're looking at, it fluctuate between 15 to 18 percent of the U.S. is uninsured. But I have seen a couple of articles already. The Kaiser Foundation is already quoting that after this law goes through, we're still looking at about 15 percent of the population being uninsured. So I don't know that we actually fixed that. As far as the affordable piece, again, if you're somebody who was in a state that expanded their Medicaid and you now have full Medicaid, that's a benefit to you. If you're somebody who is getting a tax credit and now you can afford to have insurance, that made it more affordable for you. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole group of people that aren't going to qualify for either one of those programs, and now they're paying more for their insurance premiums. And they may be reluctant. And with insurance carriers and durable medical companies, with these additional taxes, they're seeing that increased cost too. So it all's, it's going to play out. I mean, it's, I don't know that well, we're going to fix the, the, the word actuary, I mean, it, it comes with when this whole business that you're in is to a certain degree. Did they play a role in trying to figure out why, oh, they, why they make those changes uh, that you just talked about? Yeah, I mean, that's, and, that's what's their if, if you were an actuary, I, I can't even imagine being an actuary in the last four years because you were given a set of parameters from the federal government right. of what the policies had to cover, the maximum amount of pocket, and it has to fit this percentage, this right. actuary percentage. And that's been the biggest struggle for the insurance carriers is just trying to figure out how to design not just the standard plan, that they didn't even get the really the information and the details until earlier this year. I mean, it was pretty late in coming yeah. to help them even decide and design their plans. Mm -hmm. But also if they wanted to do something innovative, right? So they had to stay within that actuary balance. Um, that's tough. And, and for a carrier to say, well, I'm, for the first time ever, I can't do risk assessment, that's a challenge. Um, they, they just, I think this first year, everybody's kind of waiting to see how it plays out. I think, I think year two and year three are actually going to be a lot more interesting on cost. I think this first year, some carriers tried to come in very competitive and, and aggressive, and we hope that they can, they, can, they can hold those rates. But I have a feeling that when we get two, three, four years down, whether or not we got the young people in, so if we didn't, then we're going to have just the older, less healthy people. That's going to drive those claims, drive those premiums up. So we'll see what we end up with. Well, you know, I would say that maybe the, the, the benefit, if you will, of the squabbles between the folks up in Congress and whatever, in the Senate and whatever, at least maybe they may be doing some, i.e., some some, uh, some investigations and this, that, and that. You know, basically going back and re looking at every part of the Obamacare. I hope so. That might be a benefit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because there's pieces of the law that, that are going to hugely benefit people. But when we look at the entire thing, right. there's definitely there's pieces major, major that were amiss. I mean, they there was programs built within the law, um, the the national high risk pool, the re the reinvestment or for the early retirees. Mm -hmm. Those plans didn't even make it to the to 2014. We had a the Class Act, which was going to be um, basically a national long term care program. It couldn't even get off the ground because the numbers didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think my biggest um, complaint about the law is that. I don't know who was running the numbers. I yeah, just don't yeah, see, yeah. you know, and, and we probably tackled just too much at one point. We needed to break it down. And, and the reality is when we get down and talk about this, when we talk about health care costs and our rising health care costs, there's a lot of factors. And we touched on this last week. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it comes down to, number one, to the consumer and their accountability. We've, we've got to, as a nation, think differently, move differently, eat differently. But in addition, you've got other government programs that are feeding into that high cost uh, Medicare and Medicaid, they pay doctors at a lower rate mm -hmm. than a standard rate, and that has to be made up someplace. The doctor's not going to walk away from that lost money. Um, an overuse of medications, um, not having any tort reform. We touched on all this last week. Yeah, so there's a yeah, lot of things yeah. that we probably should have really worked on in that law, but we didn't. So I'm hoping now we can fix the things that aren't working, and maybe we can start to tackle some of those pieces that would actually better serve in bringing down the cost of yeah. health care. Mm -hmm. That's the key piece. Okay. Look, we got about three minutes, and naturally the seniors are just waiting for you to, give, to say something like to, to them about, about where do they fit in all of this? Is. Are they part of this process? What impact will it have Absolutely. on their present system? Would you just share okay. some So uh, Medicare, there isn't any significant changes in the ACA to Medicare except for one, and that's closing the, the coverage gap for prescriptions. Medicare Part D, the prescription program, they are going to close that gap, which has been pr a hardship for people that fell into the, to the donut hole or the coverage gap. It will take them 10 years, so officially by 2020 we'll see that gap close. Um, 
as far as all the literature that they get, you know, first of all, a senior citizen on Medicare is not going to go through the exchange. Mm -hmm. That's that's for health insurance. That's pre-65. So if you're on Medicare, you're probably either on original Medicare A and B only, or maybe you've uh, bought into a Medicare Advantage plan that probably has your medical and prescription combined, or maybe you went with a Medigap plan, and, and that allows you to go to doctors with very little out of pocket costs, but then you had to go buy a drug plan. What I would tell any senior citizen out there right now is we are in that annual enrollment period. It mm -hmm. opened up on October 15th. It will officially close on December 7th. During that period, you are getting a ton of information in the mail. Um, hopefully, you're not getting cold calls. It's not supposed to be allowed, but that could be happening. Oh, that's good, folks. Yeah. <laughs> so during that time period, I would advise any of our Medicare beneficiaries, look at what you have. Just mm -hmm. verify, is this plan still going to work for me, both in the monthly premium, the out-of-pocket cost to see the doctor, is my doctor still on the plan if you're on a Medicare Advantage, and, and my medications. One of the busiest things that I do during this time of year is both my staff and I will, will work with our clients to figure out what's your medication list right now, did it change, and how does that impact your current coverage? If we plug that in, are one of your medications not going to be covered next year? Is the cost going to double on you? And if that's the case, is there a better program? Can we okay. find a better program? So that's what needs to happen right now for our Medicare beneficiaries. They just need to understand this is their window. Look at what you've got. All your carriers sent you everything that you need. Uh, if you need help, ask for you know friends, family. You can certainly uh, call volunteers. Call you can call the call, call, call agent. agent. Sure. If you're not working with an agent, agent try okay. to find an agent. Call Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, this has been great. Trust Thank me, you. this has been, I mean, it's really been great. I'm sure that the viewing audience really appreciate the facts that you've given them. Now they have some sense of what's going on in Congress, but more so their own personal issues of this whole piece, that purse, yeah. as well as their own health. It's going to impact okay. all of us. Thank you very much, Lisa. We really appreciate that. Again, that's, this is Lisa Letter, Letterman. Littenmeyer. 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 <laughs> From Health Sources Northwest. Okay. And the phone number again, Lisa? 503 503-650-2199. Thanks very much. Thank you. We appreciate that. Good. Good okay. to be here. Thanks. Sure enough. Again, this is Bruce Broussard, Oregon Voters Digest. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. I guess we had a couple more minutes, but again, that's, hey, how about you choose? I got them in there too, right? You choose. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We're okay. We're now.